Um, I don't have much to say. <laughs> but I just wanted to capture this moment. I got my little canteen that Ryan Wyrick gave me that we we collectively won in a raffle um, back when we were raising money for somebody that we know. Um, and yeah. Uh, got a little cooler too. They're like kids sized stuff. But, uh, I've brought chilled coffee. It's not really iced anymore. And yeah, just out after the vigil slash protest. <laughs> I like your outfit. <laughs> um, just downtown. Actually, this isn't downtown Grand Haven. This is called Center Town. So, I think I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, I, I'm really just marking time for myself and I feel like this bench is always going to stick with me now because I've felt a great sense of peace here, a real simplicity in letting go of things. I was searching for somebody on Facebook and then I just kind of was like, well, I can also just let that go and let that person go if they don't want to be found by me. And then I wished a happy birthday to my friend James. And, which it's adorable to realize that James has a birthday very close to Brian's and a lot of the people I've ever loved and thought were amazing and kind in my life were uh, born right around this time. <laughs> Some of the kindest people I know. <laughs> if you believe in astrology, cancers, soft-spoken often, soft-hearted, tender-hearted would be more accurate because sometimes fierce-hearted. Um, guys are talking very loud. <laughs> I think they're renovating um, Guitar Haven. Um, yeah. There's a little cafe, outdoor patio thing. For the, um, there's a restaurant there. So, so this bench is a nice little memory for me now, sitting in the sunshine, reflecting on peacetime, personal peacetime. I've been saying for a long time that I'm in my own personal peacetime, and I was saying that in terms of like privilege, like my family's all alive except for my grandparents, but they passed away quite a while ago. Um, so I'm grateful to have a big and warm-hearted or mm, how do I call it like almost a clannish kind of family and I'm grateful for all the times we get together we got together in December before all this hit and all of us were there and it was amazing in Wisconsin for Kurt's wedding my cousin <laughs> sometimes I feel like so much like these are for myself that I forget to even explain um, but anyway uh, you know and so even amidst all of the social stuff going on and everything that I believe and I'm growing into, um, I still feel gratitude and joy because, because life has incredibly difficult times and incredibly difficult chapters. And if I don't really pause and appreciate the sunshine, appreciate my feelings of connection and belonging to this town, to a little bench, to a poor man's way of enjoying an afternoon, which is just, you know, go out on your bike. I mean, yes, also the, the vigil and protest, but, you know. It's a choice to not let this very loud, angry man ruin my peace. 
I'm lucky to have a choice that I could get up and go to a different bench too. But but if I spend my time right now wishing that he would talk quieter, then that is giving away my peace to someone else and someone else's choices. And I'm always needing to learn that lesson, how to just kind of be in my own sense of peace, feel the sunshine, feel the joy. Sometimes a way to be at peace in those moments is to even just fully give in to it. And like, I've done this before like in a coffee shop, like if the people near me are really, really loud and I was trying to feel reflective and joy, especially if I was just feeling it minutes earlier, which I was, and then this guy pulled up and did this really dangerous like U-turn and uh, an elderly man walking next to me was like looking at him in disbelief and so was I and then I finally just shook my head and went back into my journal and and now this guy is also just being very loud the same way his driving was very loud and I don't know looks like he has lots of instruments for the new guitar haven eh, whatever it's it's what it is I uh oh now they're going inside <laughs> But, oh, so the trick that I learned is to just kind of give in to it. And I know that sounds strange, but you just observe. You just accept that this is what reality is right now. Ooh, I feel like a bug on my booty. <laughs> and, and when you just kind of give in to it as reality, as this is the reality of right now, and if you're free to get up and go, you can go. But I think I used to use like meditative techniques to almost shame myself into like well, why can't I block this out or why can't I why can't I be as peaceful as I was a minute ago and it's like well because there's a loud man yelling loudly to his friend <laughs> in a sort of gruff almost like a New Yorker or Italian way hey! oh! <laughs> becoming known in your previously anonymous feeling small town is that you know now that I've played at this little spiritual enrichment center C3 and I played a library show a few years back I'm having more and more experiences where people really do if I say Jessica they don't know me but if I say Jessica in the rainbow they're like what oh and considering how little I feel like I have a fan base here like pretty much no one ever I, even if I post on like the the forum for this town. I don't really feel a huge reaction from people, so I just don't really use that. Um, it's not really my vibe uh, to be promotional in general. Every time I've tried it, I've felt like a poser and not like a poser um, that anyone needs to be doing that kind of posing. Like More like a poser in the sense that like I'm pretending to believe in these articles that have been uh, flooding my inbox for 10 years of like you should be doing this you should be doing this if you if you're not successful it's because you're doing x y and z wrong and it's like you know what <laughs> the creative arts were supposed to be a way that all of us who turned to it in adolescence or childhood or teenage years or even adulthood we turned to it as a form of like personal therapy like as a way to process our emotions and connect with others in the process of doing so and so if then all these articles flood our inbox for a decade or longer of why we're not doing it right like you're gonna pick up some really negative thoughts you're gonna end up feeling really negatively about the thing that originally was a very strong positive for you so get back to that. Like, don't. <laughs> it took me way too long to learn to stop reading those things and to learn that one size does not fit all. And the people who are successful are not reading those things. They're just successful. They're not strategizing and marketing correctly. Maybe they're uh, aligning themselves with people whose business it is to do that. Maybe they are. But the artist isn't the one doing that. They're not constantly hustling and trying to figure out how to get your money and get you to like them. That's not what being an artist is. So if you, if you turned to the creative arts as a way 
to heal something or express something and then it turned on you, that's why. Because capitalism got in there and told you that you were doing it wrong from a capitalistic perspective. And the thing is, capitalism is what's wrong. No offense, capitalism. Like, I appreciate that. Mm. I appreciate the society that I live in. I really do. I appreciate that I can kind of choose where I want to rise to based on certain things, uh, based on effort, based on preferences. I hope that you too can appreciate that some of us are dealt different hands than others and that privilege is very real and I had more privileges as a child before certain things happened to me but privilege is real and so you know it's that whole image of like we're all at the starting line and then privilege is like people getting to go ahead while others have to wait at the starting line and then finally when the gun shoots to start it's like some people are literally so far ahead that like Yes, we can all put in more effort and, and do certain things and pull ourselves up by some sort of bootstraps, but I was just talking about that in the, in the last video, like, sometimes there's only so much you can do to even come close to catching up, let alone having any advantages. So, and why would the people who have advantages want to concede and say, oh, here you go, have some of mine, because here you go, have some of mine means they move back in line. And so I understand, but this is why it's so hard for a rich man to get into heaven through the eye of a needle. Because if you have everything, if you are first in the race, why, why would the person winning the race, which I kind of was in some ways in childhood, I was always an A student and I won a lot of competitions. So why would someone willingly want to go to the back of the line? I don't like the ways that I'm in the back of the line. You know, the ways that we're arguing with logic you know, making pro arguing with logic instead of with our wallets, arguing with logic that someone should give up some of their privileges so that others can have more privileges, like that, of course that's not gonna get through. Why would that get through? Why would someone willingly give up any of their privileges or advantages or anything that causes them joy in a fairly bleak and dark at times world? So I think it's more just about aligning yourself. Like we can shout and shout and shout our president's crazy or this is crazy or this is crazy but it's not doing anything it's just making it kind of laughable and but when you when you stand up with your alignment or with your wallet and by alignment I just mean like if you believe in something go to the vigil go to the protest you know make make it very obvious where people's values lie and that puts pressure on people that puts pressure on people to make some changes because they need you for their businesses to you know <laughs> I'm really scared of bees lately. This one's huge. I don't, I think it's because I use uh, this perfume. It's vanilla scented and it probably smells a little too much like honey. And so I know they like me, but I don't think they like me for me. <laughs> I think they just like how I smell. <laughs> it smells like cookies. I should really not put it on when I go outside. I think I didn't put it on. I think I put it on last night, yeah. And then maybe, maybe it's the sunscreen. That probably smells good too. Anyway, I've learned that when things interrupt me that that's a good cue. So I try to just follow my cues. Um, one of the best things that ever happened to me was um, me and Brian were both very introverted. And in our house, I, I started in my prayer and meditation kind of sensing that whenever Brian interrupts, whether I'm writing a song, whether anything, I need to just learn to embrace the interruption. And it has turned into the most joyful relationship of my life. Like, it already was, but now it's like I almost see the interruptions as like a moment from God or a moment from the universe kind of realigning me. And it's deeply joyful. So if I ever was a person who had any anger or irritation, that was the biggest area where it was, where it was in. So like anger at the interruption from the people talking loudly or anger at that bee interrupting because I had a train of thought going or anger at a person coming in the room when I was a kid and writing songs and I was on a roll and then getting interrupted and being like dang it you know or making a show out of little people and recording it on a tape recorder like I was always in my head and so that was probably my number one anger always in my life was being like interrupted from whatever flow I was in which is ironic then that as a talker I can be an interrupter 
And so I understand people's frustration around somebody who can be as intense as me because I don't often mean to interrupt. And that's probably why I choose to have very few <laughs> close friends because it just makes me feel really embarrassed about myself if I get excited. It's like an ADD kind of thing almost. But, but I try not to do it. Or if I do it, I try to apologize and then encourage them to interrupt me as well. <laughs> but sometimes it just has to do with like losing your train of thought. When I used to like very disciplined let people finish their their point and then wait to speak always like as a as a firm 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 rule I would often completely forget whatever I wanted to share with them in response and and then sometimes for some people and this is why very few people are probably a good match for me but for some people that meant that when they were done speaking I said nothing because I couldn't remember what I wanted to share with them and then I would say nothing and then that would seem to make them more uncomfortable because they knew that I was full of ideas and they had actually shared something with me kind of seeking ideas and this is not true in all cases but this is situations where I realized I can't fundamentalistly never interject like I for me there's a difference between interjecting and interrupting um, interrupting is in my view interrupting is like someone's talking and you cut them off and you go on your own thing and it has nothing to do with what they were sharing it's very dismissive very shut it shuts people down it happens to me a lot actually in like group situations where I feel like what I'm sharing doesn't have value especially to like confident men <laughs> so I, I try to never interrupt I try to always give insane amounts of intention I was gonna say attention attention and intention and value to what a person's sharing but sometimes I do interject um, that might be being a person who's like yes Oh, I totally get that. Or yeah, you know, and just saying things like that. Okay, this bee. Hi, buddy. I just don't want him to go in my bag and then find him later. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then sometimes interjecting with like, oh my gosh, or, or like asking a question for clarification. Hi, Bumblebee. I'm getting away from you. You may have the bench. <laughs> um, so, I don't know that's not for everybody but I just don't believe in hard and fast rules because if the hard and fast rule makes me think I can never have friends because I'm way too communicative and my brain moves 20 billion miles a minute I mean there have been times though where I've interjected and then regretted it because I liked the path that their own mind was going down and I knew that there was something I could learn from them and also that creating that space for them would give them value and then I interject and then they change what they're telling me and then I'm like dang it like, why didn't I let them finish and then interject? And it's, it's a mixture of fear that I'll forget to ask them the thing. Um, and then it's a mixture of that and just like a weird restlessness that clearly is why I YouTube because I don't know anyone else who can't stop thinking this much on themes that, <laughs> I don't know. I know people who say their brain drives them crazy, but most people act like it's in a negative way. And I feel like I've done all this inner spiritual work and I've healed and forgive, you know, abusers and, and all kinds of past stuff. And, and so I, my brain is often always going, but like it's in a very light feeling way and in a very positive feeling way. It feels like joy. It feels like a kind of explosive out of the top of my head kind of energy, mm, kind of also out of my mouth and my eyes and my throat and my heart and I got feelings and my creativity and I don't know everything it just feels like everything it feels like being a very big tree and a tree that's mixed with sparklers I don't know I just always feel so much and it's a very intense feeling but I was enjoying the intensity just sitting by myself enjoying the Sun but then before I got up and left the bench I wanted to make a video and then that guy started talking and then this turned into how to how to deal with distractions and other people which I'm always growing and I'm always trying to learn from oh and I had started it as it being a video about guilt living in a place that you love and feeling joy in your own personal peacetime and feeling joy in your own personal accomplishments or the positives in your life like how can we do that when we feel guilt that not everyone has what we have and the thing is like almost every house I go past is probably a homeowner so why do I feel guilty having, like does every single homeowner feel guilty owning a home? 
instead of selling their home and renting and giving that money away to charity, should they feel that? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think wealth is inherently wrong because I think a lot of times it's people trying to be self-sufficient so that they're not a burden on others and so that they can, I don't know, take care of themselves and maybe even care for others too. So I know they say like money is the root of all evil, but I think uh, that's a summary. It's love of money is the root of all evil. You know, say, say you do get that house and then you just love money so much, you just would rather have a second house too, and a third house, and a fourth house, and a fifth house. Like that would be love of money, which is really like love of power. And that'd be like love of your own, like maybe a person who has billions of dollars has a love of future power. Like they believe that if they hold on to their billions of dollars, then even 20 years from now, they would have future power. And then that's not really believing in God. I don't think. Because if you need to plan out your life so that 20 years from now, you still will know that you're a billionaire. It's like, but what if conditions change in the world and money loses its value? What if what's valued is authenticity and then I'm in power and you're not? What if people who have money are shamed so deeply by society that all your money won't buy you anything because you won't have any social value the way someone like me maybe would? Because I am a genuine person who tries to admit my faults and find ways to grow and find ways to learn from other people and you are a person hoarding money. Like what if that no longer has any social currency someday? I don't know. I'm just saying, like, you have to have a faith in something bigger than you and bigger than money. You have to have a faith in something, I don't know, in order to see what's 20 years out. Like, I don't know what's 20 years out. I don't know what's 20 days out from now. I don't know how the world will be and I don't know how I will be. And yes, I can see how money would give me a sense of security that I would be fine because I could just buy things, buy buy a new car, buy a new house, buy a new plane ticket, buy my way onto a rocket ship and move to Mars. I don't know. I can see how money could provide that comfort, but you would have to have a lot of money to believe in money. <laughs> like you would have to have so much money to believe in money over God. Like I just, I have to believe that I, I, one of the things I believe in the most in the Bible is the idea that if I focus on God and what God wants for my life, which is this, which is, oh, I don't have a rainbow on my hat right now, which is this, which is this. If I focus on what God wants, for, which is YouTubing, like, which is anything that I feel inspired to do, which is making up songs, which is all of it. Like, if I focus on what I feel God wants for my life, and it's okay if you don't believe in God, I do. <laughs> You know, but when I focus on what I believe God wants for my life, what feels true between me and God, it's a very personal, sacred thing. When I focus on that, then I believe in the thing in the Bible. I don't believe in everything in the Bible, or at least I believe it could have been cherry picked or rewritten or whatever. I mean, I've tried to read the whole thing, but it's, and there are aspects that are terrifying and or, I don't know, who do I, what do I know? I don't know. I don't want to get into legalistic stuff, but my point is, Obviously, there are churches that disagree. I mean, most churches seem to disagree with each other, so I can't take that on. That's way beyond my pay grade, which is nothing. My YouTube videos are free, so <laughs> me and God, we are okay on that one. Like, that's not my mission to, like, take on churches or take on people from churches who seem to cherry-pick one thing and not another thing and then accuse sinners of one thing, but then they themselves are sinning because we're all sinning if you believe in, I mean, even if you don't give it that word, we're all making mistakes and we're all growing. Like, that's what it is. So why would you, <laughs> why would you sit and stare and point at somebody else for the things that they might be making mistakes on when you yourself are making mistakes. Like that's what being alive is. That's the point. We're growing. You're growing. You're like a little flower and you're growing and you're not there yet and you're not there yet. And when you're in absolute perfect bloom, why is that something to attain or to get to? Thought the bee just stung me and it was just my own feelings. <laughs> But like when you are in perfect bloom, then after that, now you're going to start to decay. Like, it, it, none of it's a goal. It's not a destination. It's the whole thing is the story. The whole thing is the journey. The whole thing is 
I mean, th that word sin is way too loaded. It's just, it's, it's mistakes or it's, it's imperfections, but they're not, that's not a negative. It's a positive. It's, it's the whole point. I'm not God. I don't need to be God. I'm not fixed in time. I'm not done. I'm not perfect. And I never can be. And if there is one moment in my life that feels like a full bloom moment, then cool. But why would I want to hurry up and get to that? Because then after that, then now I move towards death. I, it, I mean, we're all, <laughs> it's maybe it's this like mountains. I mean, maybe it's tons of tiny peaks. I don't know. Or maybe your life ends abruptly at some point. I mean, I, I don't think we get, we're not supposed to know. That's part of the human experience. <sighs> so anyway, between me and God, I make these little videos and I do this and this is my piece. This is my little piece and, oh yeah, so back to money. So I put my faith in God and that's the piece in the Bible. I don't remember the Bible verse because I don't study enough or anything, but you know, my grandma was a nun and I seemed to put my flag on that mountain and I was raised Christian and whatever, but I also studied Taoism and lots of things and blah, blah, blah. My point is, <laughs> that's blah, 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 because defensiveness and weirdness and awkwardness and explainingness and that never brings me joy. So back to my point, money, money. If I put my faith in God and there's that part in the Bible that says, you know, that God cares for the birds, God cares for the least among you, you know, why wouldn't he care for you? Basically, God will give you clothes and food and stuff and focus on God. <laughs> and that's been true in my life. I put my focus on spiritual things. I put my focus on growth oriented, growth oriented things. I put my focus on healing. I put my focus on forgiving, forgiving people who have hurt me or wronged me or welcomed me in and then realized who I was and then shut me out. Um, I put my focus on the ways that I've felt hurt and the ways that I've hurt others. And I try to keep that a very balanced thing so that I never think that I'm separate from my own humanity. My own humanity being other people. We're all the same in that. We all are hurting people the same way we're being hurt. And so like, when I put my focus, like all my energy on God like that, all my energy on the dance between humanity and connecting with God, spirituality, whether it's Christianity or whether it's anything wholesome, <laughs> like when my focus is on that, God cares for me and my needs get met. And there are always new questions and there are always new issues that I have with being alive. Like what a dumb issue to feel guilty living in a town that I actually love. What a dumb issue to worry that it's a little bit more conservative than liberal. That's such a dumb issue, but it haunted me for years. And now it doesn't haunt me. I just go to the peace vigil and I'm just like, whatever. I'm gonna just show up and be part of the solution, I guess, or be part of the balancing. It's just a balancing. Someone I love pointed it out to me, like if everybody who felt like there weren't enough progressives in a slightly more conservative town moved away, then there'd be even fewer liberals or progressives. So, you know, this place, more so than anywhere I've lived, seems to hold a balance fairly well in the sense that it's open to tourism. So. It's, it's open. It has to be open. It has to welcome people from all countries. It has to welcome people from all backgrounds. It doesn't have to have a poorer section of town, but it does. It doesn't have to do any of these things, but it does. It, I don't know. Sometimes I just feel like I live in paradise and I probably shouldn't say that out loud because maybe it would change if a ton of people flocked here. It seemed like that's what was happening. Um, it seemed like the more they were winning awards of like best place to retire, best seaside town. We're on a lake, not as the ocean, but we won like best seaside town in like Condé Nast magazine or something. 
um, in like 2014 or something like that. And it seemed like the more Grand Haven kept tooting its own horn, the more it was attracting more and more tourism and causing problems that it didn't quite know how to solve. And so suddenly now there were petitions for like parking garages, like big structures, and then the, the locals were like, no, don't build that. Like, that's ugly. We love that spot. It's a place where there's like a big mural in an open field. And it's like, no, we don't want that giant parking structure there. And then there was like a, a whole petition going around for a while of like, no, don't just let people just buy up any property anywhere ever and turn everything into Airbnbs. Like, no, we like the community feeling downtown. And it's like checks and balances. I just feel like there might be a decent amount of checks and balances here. So there just may have always been more diversity than I realized here because, you know, yes, they're about community values or family values, but they're also about progressive and, you know, inviting more tourism or anything. So, so, <laughs> the person is back. <laughs> um, I won't talk about them or put them in my YouTube video, but, um, yeah, so that's, those are my thoughts for today. Thanks. <laughs> and now I know that that person likes my socks. So maybe they're a nice person and <laughs> they were just talking loud and that's mean of me. <laughs> well, I guess it's not mean. It's not mean to accurately perceive things. Uh, the same way I need to forgive people who accurately perceive that I talk a lot. Like if someone's like, oh, she's not for me. She talks way too much. Like that's not an insult. They may mean it insultingly because it's frustrating them or overwhelming them, but it's not actually an insult. It's just accurately perceiving something. So I think a lot of my childhood, I was probably accurately perceived and it made me feel bad because I wanted to be liked. And sometimes when you're a very, 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 very specific thing, especially if it's a thing that you're not seeing all around you, sometimes you don't get to be liked. Or you get to be like intensely liked by a few, which I've gotten to have in the last year, especially the more I've really grown into myself. You get to be like intensely liked by a few, like throwing a dart and you're the bullseye. And it's like a really cool feeling, but it almost doesn't <laughs> replace the feeling you wanted to have, which was to be the whole dartboard. You wanted to be just like, I don't know, loved by all, I guess. And instead, you're a very specific point of light and definitely, definitely not loved by all. Although I will say, like, one thing with being a person who's this specifically either weird or just, I guess, unique, I don't know, just does their own thing. When you, are, when you become a person who does your own thing, whatever your own thing is, like, don't do my thing. Like, my thing's weird and it doesn't win you any friends or brownie points. So, like, just do your own thing. Don't imitate my, I mean, unless you want to imitate and then realize it's not for you like they say that imitation is like how you find yourself I guess I don't know Beethoven imitated for the first two-thirds of his life and then he found his own sound and so like where was I going with that imitating uh no <laughs> something about a bullseye I don't know points of light mm. <laughs> yeah I am even losing my train of thought um so yeah you can be yourself and find yourself and in the process of finding yourself you might be trying other people's approaches to life on for size that's certainly what I have done maybe that's what I was doing when I was listening to all those articles in my inbox about how to be successful and this and that I was just trying things on for size maybe I need to be less hard on myself for listening to those articles all those years because maybe by listening to them and worrying about them, that's how I came to believe in the things I now believe in. Which is that that approach doesn't work for me. And maybe doesn't work for a lot of people. And I'm just being a spokesperson for that. <laughs> like, do your own thing. If I can't if I can't make that clear through my words, I'll make it clear through just watching my life. Like, just do your own thing. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> too many words even for me. I'm gonna go enjoy the rest of the day. Goodbye.